Grafton. Grafton? That's yeah. Danish, damn. Yeah. I'm surprised that you knew some Danish. That's uh -huh. that really surprised me. Okay. So I'm here with Wicked. I'm gonna do one of my grilled interviews with him. So the place I want to start with you. Usually I always just start with like a point in someone's career and go from there, okay? But actually I want to do like a general early part of your career. So if we think about just before CLG, so 2011, the end of this period. On one hand, whenever you bring that period up, people mention people like Hotshot GG because he's like the biggest streamer at the time. They mention like CLG, remember Fnatic winning season one. But even though that was when SK was just starting to get good, I've actually seen some people say that they thought you were like the best top laner at the time, like you were one of the best players in all of Europe. Like, do you actually think back on yourself in any of these, in this way? So, I actually think back on myself quite often. I think at that time I was the best top laner. The problem right now is I haven't played as much as I used to because at that time I was like, I wake up, I play, I go to school, I play, then I eat and then I play again and then I sleep. So that's pretty much my schedule and sometimes I skip school to play even more and other things. Right now I don't play as much because I wake up, we cook, we do laundry, we are more lazy now, in a way, like people get more lazy after they play the same game for a long time. Uh, so I start to miss CS and lane and so on, which I've almost never did back in the time. I mean, obviously one of the problems with that era was that there weren't as many big tournaments where all the teams from all over the world went. So it was hard for people to know who really is the best, you know? But the interesting thing is while you were in SK and you went to these three uh, IEMs, every single one you got to play a CLG and since people said at the time people used to say not only was Hotshot the best top laner but he was the best player in the world or whatever because he was the most popular was it was any of it overhyped like since you played against him was he really like that good at the time so I think at that time Hotshot was really good the problem is that he was overhyped because CLG was amazing as a team and he was the leader so you're always going to get overhyped if your team is doing good and you're the leader um, I think Hotshot had a fairly weak laning phase compared to other players but he was very aggressive and he wasn't afraid of anything, so that gave him an advantage in the mid and late game. When people talk about him then and say he was the best player in the world or whatever they say, very like complimentary things. Now, if we think of all the, the good top laners since, they tend to be the people who are very aggressive or they win the 1v1s, etc. And obviously that's not his style. He doesn't even try to play that style now. So now people are totally down on him, and especially in NA, and they're saying, oh, he's not even good enough. He should be cut from his own team, etc. If someone could at one point in time be the best player in the world, theoretically, how can it really be the case that now they can't even, according to the public at least, like be a functional part of a team? Like, Is his style really that out of vogue with what's in the meta? So I don't even think his style is that bad. The problem is that he changed his style. He used to be really aggressive, he used to always push side lanes, he used to never be afraid of pushing and not even afraid of dying. Like He just used to push, push, push and put a lot of pressure on the enemy team. But now he's gone into a defensive mindset, everyone's flaming him every time he does something wrong. And I think if you start taking that flame in, you're going to get affected in your play style and you're going to play more and more passive. And I think it became a snowball for him. I mean, just from what you know from playing him and being in CLG when you were practicing, etc. in Season 2, I mean, could he be like one of these top players who's actually carrying again? Is it within his skill set for what like the current matter is? I think it's easily in his skill set, but the problem is he doesn't have the confidence anymore. And that, that's what I think we are struggling with right now, because the you're winning, it's easy, you have confidence, and you just keep winning. And then once you play a bottom team, it's harder because you don't take them as serious, which is normal. You obviously gonna try harder for second best team than fifth. That's normal. Um, right now, our confidence is really bad because we have been losing to a lot of teams. Randomly, either we hit or miss, either we play really good or we play terrible. And that's our problem right now. Whenever people think of uh, EG but as CLG, they're gonna think of the most famous stall out games. And so everyone makes out as though every game was just like trying to be like 50 minutes long and that everyone was super passive with an EG, never taking any risks. And it's understandable why people might think that for some famous games, or for example, Frog and so good at farming up, it's like makes sense for him to do that, or the bottom lane is pretty passive. But in terms of your game, I mean, you've always actually been known just individually as like an aggressive player who wants to do 1v1 in his lane. How was, uh, was Wicked different in CLG than he was when he was in SK, aside from the meta changing, etc.? Were you still the same sort of player? I think I've always been the same sort of player. I always used to say I play the four defensive players and I'm aggressive. And I think that's kind of good because I used to play the tanky champions that had to engage. So whenever they were playing fairly defensive, but whenever we got a small advantage, I would always be instantly there and I would just go in. Which I think is good because if you have five defensive players, it's really bad in my opinion. Right now we changed a bit our play style, so Peter's playing way more aggressive, Krebel's playing more aggressive, Frog is playing more aggressive, and we're just going for the early wins. But we used to just think, 
be a better than an enemy team, we are a better team as together. So we could win team fights even if we were behind. But we don't think that way anymore. When you think of uh, season two, a lot of the strong players, people would have said like mid and AD maybe. These were like very strong positions in the game. But actually, if you look at nearly all the elite teams now in season three, nearly all of them have a very strong top laner, especially these Asian teams. Nearly all of them have a really good top laner, it seems. Uh, has the game shifted in some way so that top's like more prominent now? What do you think of the, the importance of the role within a team? I think top laner is a player that needs to be able to take care of himself in any situation. Where the AD, he can get behind, but he got the support to help him, he can get the jungler, he can get the mid to help him. And they're often playing as four together with top laners isolated on another lane, split pushing or doing other stuff for the team. And uh, does that mean you've had to adapt your game in any specific way since Season 2's style? Um, for me, I actually think I've gone away from the meta where I used to be in this meta that we're playing right now. I used to always split push, I didn't even care about my team, I was like, oh you guys die, it's your fault, I don't even care, I'm just going to do my thing. Right now, I think I play too much about my team, I care too much about others, and I should just stop caring. If they make a mistake, they're going to die, that's fine. I should just do what I need to do. I think when a lot of fans think of the top position, they still imagine like almost as far back as like season one, early season two, where it was a lot of just 1v1 only. And so, yeah, you could like see if one person's winning his lane against this guy, he's probably better than him in that matchup. But since now there's so much of the 2v1 meta, is it the case that, I mean, I saw this interesting comment you made before you played Soaz in that 1v1. You'd actually said when you were kind of making the kiss as to why you should be the person who got voted for All-Stars, you were saying like, I actually think that uh, I could do as good a job or him or better at the All-Stars and that part of the reason you thought Soaz was getting so much attention was because his team was winning. And so if your team's doing really well and you're, everyone's playing really well, it's going to make you look a lot better necessarily than if your team's doing badly, you'd have to be like exceptional just to look as good, you know. Can you sort of elaborate on this concept? Because to fans, I don't think it's that clear always, you know. Well, the battle between me and Source was pretty much, I had the popul popularity and he had the winning team, so it was kind of equal and we both got hyped up because I'm popular and he was in the best team. Um, I don't think that he's underrated or overrated in any way, I think he's a really good top laner and I personally thought that I was better than him 1 versus 1, I'm not sure anymore because the 1 versus 1 we took. We didn't really play the only top lane champions, but still, yeah. 1 versus 1, I noticed that I made mistakes, I might have been nervous in that, I'm not sure. But I think it's something we will find out over the next couple of months. But in what areas were you thinking to yourself before that game? Like, I'm better than him in these areas or in this style? What were um, you thinking of? I thought that I was better than him as an individual player, just straight up. Mm -hmm. But as a team player, because he's playing in his team, they're really good working together. I thought he was better with Fnatic. So if he got the back of his team, he would obviously fit better in Fnatic. But without the team, I thought that I was better. Oh, okay. What is Salah's good at then? What are his strengths, do you think? I think his strength is that he can always adapt, he can play anything pretty much. So sometimes they're playing Elise where he goes to pull his items on top lane and they have a Siren bottom where she just builds AP and gets farm. Since he's actually someone who, like you, has been around in the European scene since the very beginning basically, but since he's not someone who streamed etc, he, he hasn't really built a following the same way. So now people are saying, oh, so as is good, he's a top player, but it seems like he sort of went under the radar a bit for fans. Uh, was he always like a top top player in the, in the past or has he grown into it? What do you think? So I don't think that Soas have always been a good top laner. He used to play other roles like jungle, but I've always noticed that Soas had one of the best mechanics, especially um, half a year ago or so, he used to play a lot of Lee Sin and he always hit his skill shots. So he's one of the best mechanical players in Europe for sure. Okay. Right. I don't actually know that much about League of Legends, so when I set this question up, if I've got it completely wrong and it's bollocks, like you can just tell me. But when I read like opinions on why EG wasn't doing as as well, here's what here's like an in-depth opinion that I read somewhere, but I couldn't write it down, so I haven't got it word for word. Essentially, someone said that during season two the way teams would tend to approach your team is since Froggen would just like essentially sort of kill the team if they played him straight up because he was his peak then you could say a lot of teams would focus their attack around trying to shut Froggen down and then if Froggen got shut down or neutralized or so, to some degree he wasn't able to just carry himself in the middle then it fell to Wicked to try and carry from the top and so in season 2 that could still work like as, even as a, like a second route of attack that could still win the game for EG but then when people were criticizing you in season 3 they were saying that when that same scenario happened okay so Froggen's really good we try and shut him down now it falls to Wicked to do it that you weren't as good in certain matchups or your champion pool wasn't as good like is, is there anything to this is, it, is there any merit to it? I honestly think the only problem you're having right now is we haven't 
we are not a strong individual anymore and we're trying really hard to achieve that again. And then our confidence have been broken a bit because we used to be top two team. We didn't really care if we played against another team because we thought we were better than them at all times. Which is going to give you a confidence boost, we were arrogant, which I think is a good thing because if you're arrogant before the match, if you think the other team is worse than you, you're going to play better and you're not going to be afraid of them in any way. Is, I mean, on the similar topic though, I mean, what is your like carry potential now in Season 3, do you think? Like, can you, can you still do it to the same degree you could before? I think our main carry potential is our individual skill. For example, you saw, I don't know if you watched the last game where we just played against Scammy right now. Sure. Pete pretty much won that game alone with Crepo on bot lane because they're just carrying, they just killed people and just outplayed the enemy bot lane. And that's how we usually win our games, by one player doing an exceptional game. So actually, speaking of Gambit then, since when they were M5, they were the team that you battled with a whole bunch. Um, the funny thing about the M5 is, aside from Diamond Prox, who everyone says is this amazing jungler, a lot of people would have said, like, at each other position, there might be a player who's better in Europe. So even, even Alex Edge, some people said Froggen's better at middle, or even, like, uh, well, the other positions, everyone said people were better anyway. Yeah, as an overall team, they always get credited as, as a team, they're the best, though, overall in Europe. So when you talk about their top lane now, okay, so Darien, like what are his strengths and how strong actually is he just as an individual outside of M5, do you think? Um, I think Darren's main strength in M5 is that he doesn't care. Like he can walk to a lane, he can die seven times and he's still gonna be aggressive and he's gonna keep pushing. So he, he's dead seven times, but he's still keeping one guy busy and the other team can just win four versus four at that point if they're hurt. So what he does is no matter what, he's always gonna be a threat. Where a lot of other top lanes, if they die, four times or something like that, they're going to be useless and they're not going to do anything in the game. Who of the European tops, so you can pick any of them, are the ones who actually give you the most trouble in your matchup? Like, is there a certain style that you, you have more trouble with against than another? Well, uh, against Source, I mainly 1v2, so he doesn't really give me trouble because he always goes to our lane. I think the one that probably gives me the most trouble on top lane is Kevin. His individual mechanics is really good and it's a hard matchup against him, even if you have if I have a hero I'm comfortable with, for example, really against his Olaf, it's really hard for me to be him. If we think of uh, the, the, I, the idea of the LCS, like one of the things people assumed instantly was that it would be a big benefit for all the teams who moved to Cologne. So they'd have a gaming house, they'd be really close, they wouldn't have to fly in every week like Gambit does. And so of all those teams, it seemed like actually it made the most sense for your team because when you'd gone to Korea, it seemed like you all really benefited from this like gaming environment, whereas like a team like CLG and A, like, it, they were almost at each other's throats all the time, so it was really bad for them. And yet it's always, almost been the opposite, like you've become worse in Season 3. Was any of it to do with like shifting to the gaming house? Like What haven't you managed to get from it that you would have in the past? So I think one advantage I personally had at home was I had nothing else I needed to do or something that would distract me if I didn't want to. Like, Sure, I would go out on the weekends once in a while, but it wasn't something like, I need to go out, I need to do this, and things like that. So there was way less distractions, and I could just be like, yeah, I'm just gonna play and play and play. Where now, there's so many distractions, all the other LCS teams are here, I wanna go out with them, I wanna go out with my friends, and all that. And then you have to laundry, clean, our stuff, do cooking, and all those things, and then we have five guys together, which we distract each other as well. Whenever you're a player who's considered like a star within your team or you have carry potential, I've noticed a lot of players get into this like mindset where every time they lose, they're, they're always thinking of like the mistake that they made. So they're kind of implying that like they could have won every single game if they'd have played it perfectly, you know, which obviously isn't always the case. But are there some specific games that come to your mind where you yourself, like you think back like, ah, oh, I did like one little mistake there and that would have put us over the top. Is there anything that comes to mind? I think in every single game, if one of the players plays absolutely perfect, he can carry the game. But there's no game where anyone played perfect, you're always going to make mistakes. What you just have to do is play aggressive and make sure that the enemy makes more mistakes than you do. Is there a game in your career though that comes to mind? Like, you, you, when you think back on it, like any of the finals or the semi-finals you were in, like, ah, you know, I let that get away from me. I don't think there's any game, like, of course there's a game where I've been playing bad, and if I played better, we'd probably have won, but there's no particular game that comes to mind. When you were over in America, okay, so you got to live with uh, CLG NA over there, and then you also, in theory, were with them in Korea as well when you were living over in that environment. 
So you got to see the two drastically different like practice environments in terms of gaming houses and then the practice scene. When uh, Americans complain all the time, you know, we don't have many teams to play and all the rest of it. It sometimes seems from watching some of their scrims that they're streaming online now that even the scrims amongst the top teams they aren't like practicing seriously. Like so, like when CLG plays Curse, it looks like both teams are almost just fucking around. You know, like how different do you actually think the two scenes are? Like, can the NA scene make themselves like Korea? So I definitely say that the American scene, in my opinion, is the most lazy one. But I don't know what it is right now. But then we were over there, be a range scrims, and teams would be 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late all the time. And pretty much we were like, okay, we're gonna arrange the scrim and we expect them to be 30 minutes late, so we're just gonna order food. If they come early, we just skip the food and we just play for them. Okay. And does Europe fall somewhere between the two? Um, Europe falls between the two because Europe doesn't have as many good teams as Korea, so there's less teams to scrim, it's harder to arrange scrims. But I think that Europe got a lot of good teams and the teams are usually on time. Since, uh, <clears throat> aside from teams like CLG, M5, and then now the LCS teams, so a lot of people are watching LCS and so they know those players, there's a lot of European players who haven't played in LCS who people might not know if they don't watch every tournament. So if we throw out names like, I mean, like Angush, uh, Zaxus, Kubon, these sorts of guys who are playing top but they're not in LCS, so they're not necessarily that fan. Who of these are actually like legit tier talents? Like they could be in LCS, they could be a top player. Like which players who aren't in LCS who play top in Europe are that good, you know? So for me, I don't really scout too many players because we don't need anyone right now, and I don't think too much about the challenge teams. But I know players like for Ellen Lord and Hulbato, those two have incredible mechanical skill, and I think both of them could easily be in a top team. If we think about the <clears throat> time you spent in Korea, a lot of people, I think even though people have heard about you going there and staying for so long and scrimming and playing in OGN, I think a lot of people are confused as to like what exactly practice entails in Korea. Because I, what I've seen is when the NA teams say, okay, we're actually gonna practice properly, they will pr scrim from like two till 10 each day, so eight hours solid. But what I've heard from looking at like StarCraft in Korea is like their idea of practice is like quite different. Like it might not be eight hours of playing and it might not be eight hours of just playing. It might be like practicing one strategy for three hours, then like mechanics for, you know, is it really broken down like this from your experience? From our experience, it wasn't really broken down with that, but we don't really know what the other teams are doing either. We just knew that we scrimmed them. But one thing they do is they schedule scrims a week in advance, where Europeans mostly used to just um, go on Skype and just or rate call and just write, can you guys scrim? Can we find a scrim? Anyone wants to scrim? And it was like by minute, where in Korea they arranged it weeks in advance. If we look at the players in Korea who are playing top, there's actually a few, like, I mean, obvious examples like Mac Noon and Reaper, who not only like the star of their team in theory, but they're also like shot calling to some degree, and the whole team's sort of playing around their position. Uh, in your team, in general, I think people wouldn't define it like that at all, like how it's set up. Does it make a, does it allow a player to look a lot better individually when everything's sort of based around him? Like how, how do you compare to them in that sense? Because it sounds like you're just more in a role in your team. So... If you have a captain role, everyone's obviously going to think he's calling everything, he's the one doing everything. But that's not true. Like I'm pretty sure even in the Korean teams, it's not only the captain calling things. Everyone is doing their job and everyone's calling things because the captain doesn't know what happened on top lane if he's the mid laner and what just happened in the jungle and if the jungle can gank, he's not going to know that. So it's impossible for him to call it. I think the best thing is always to have five guys trying to work together and call together and just make the plays. Since overall the Korean team's accomplishments have been more than a lot of the European or the NA play teams, like so the teams are better, people seem to assume, fans at least, that that must mean the players are at least a little bit better or they are much better in certain positions. So there's people who will, if you ask them the top 10 mid players in the world, like the first five would all be Chinese or Korean and it'd be like Mac and these guys, they probably wouldn't even have anyone from NA or EU in there. Just individually, is someone like Mac Noon, is someone like Reaper Shy, are they really like actually ahead of all the NA and EU tops? I don't think that the Koreans are ahead of us at all in individual skill. The only advantage they have is they're playing against really good teams all the time, they're practicing a lot, and they're really confident because they need to win, they're doing everything for the wins. But Europeans right now in LCS, for example, I think people are trying less because people are getting more money and they don't need to try as hard as before. Because before it was like, I quit school, I need to win, this needs to work out, I'm screwed. So people tend to care less and work. So if you play against Mac Noon, for example, or you play against Shy, these guys who people think are like the gods of top lane, I mean, you're, 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 you can win your lane, you're not gonna have to like go even or anything, you're not gonna have to play more defensive than you would against other players? 
Um, normally, when I play games, I often disable their names just because it doesn't make any sense. Like, they're just a player, they can have a bad day, you can have a good day, you can outplay any player in the world, and they're not better than us. That's interesting because that actually makes me think of uh, what Stefano said his approach to StarCraft 2 was. Because in StarCraft 2, a lot of people focus on who the opponent is, like his name and his history and stuff. But Stefano actually said he did the opposite. He just thought of them as like, okay, if they play Zerg, then I just think of them as a Zerg. And yeah, they have strengths in this area, but it's just another Zerg I'm playing. So I play how I play against other Zergs, you know. Is, do you, so is it like the similar principle of uh, when you're playing like, you're not thinking of that, that, oh, that's Macron, you're thinking of what champion is that and what is my matchup like? Is that what it's like? So mainly what I do is like I look into what teams they play and I'm like, so let's choose the top lane who plays Jace, Elise, KL. And then I'm like, okay, if they play those champions, I need to pick something that can play against everything of that if I have to pick before them. So I'm just trying to get a safe matchup against them and then just play my lane. I've noticed amongst the top lane players, a lot of them are in this mindset now of like, I should just only play whatever's OP at the moment. So whichever OP champions are, I learn that one and I use that. What's the actual balance like between having the OP champions in your champion pool and still using the ones that aren't as OP anymore, but they're like they're your best ones? What's the balance like, do you think? Um, I've always gone for the champions I really like to play. I don't really think it's that Mobin Fist of Spare champion that's OP, because if you don't like to play it, you're not gonna become good on them. Like I, I like to play Bruces, I still play all the Bruces I used to play, Aurelia, Shen, Renekton, and I'm gonna keep playing those. Then Seth came out and I started playing him instantly because he was a Bruiser. He was OP, but I didn't know that and I just thought, yeah, he's cool, let's play him. Since you were in Korea when CLG brought in Boy Boy to be their top laner and he was like, everyone thought he was gonna be amazing and it didn't really work out. Like, what's your perspective? Why don't you think it worked out having Voivod Boy Boy there and having uh, Hotshot in the jungle? Like, what, was, what wasn't allowing him to be as good as he seemed in Dignitas and now in Curse, you know? So, CLG have been a team that talks really hard to each other and they're like, you suck, you play bad, and stuff like that. And as I said before, I think confidence is a really important thing. And I believe that they broke what was confidence and he just wouldn't play as good because he wasn't confident in his team, they didn't trust him, and if you don't trust your teammates, they're gonna do worse. Because this actually ties into you and your, the problems your team's had now. Because I saw these comments on Twitter, right, where Doublelift said about you, like he said, Wicked's really good, but the problem is his jungler never goes top. And so Saint Vicious replied and said something like, oh, that sounds familiar, because he's sort of implying it's like when Hotshot used to play with it, Voiboy, and Voiboy looked worse because his jungler was never going top. Is there, is there any merit to this? Is that anything to do with why your own style hasn't been as effective? So it might be true that I'm not doing as good because Snoopy is doing worse, but it might also be true that he's doing worse because I'm not doing as good. Like, it goes both ways and you can't really pinpoint, oh, it's because of that and that. Because it's a lot of games, sometimes you have a bad game, sometimes you have a good game. It's just a thing I think only the team knows and only the team can talk about. And it's something that, like, if Snoopy was bad, we would have kicked him and we would take a new jungler. So we don't think he's that bad. And it's the same if Frog was bad or anyone else. A lot of the NA players especially, it seems the top lane players are in this like 2v1 meta now. Like we have to do 2v1s, we have to camp out the guy who I'm gonna face. Like how much do you use that in EG? And how much is it like you asking for it and how much is the team deciding it's gonna happen? So I almost never ask for 2v1 and the team in general doesn't really ask for much either. We like to just lane our lanes because that's what we're good at. Um, 2v1 means we have to be way better at the map, we have to be better working as a team, but I think we are exceptional individual and we are not really the best team at work together. Okay, so I'm, I've, I referenced Voiboy Boy before. You've actually played him quite a few times now, especially like in the, in the later era, because when he was in Curse, for example. And so we've gotten to see him in a bunch of different teams. How, what, what actual strengths do you think he has? Because I mean, we've seen from this all-star vote now, he actually didn't even win the top. Like, Dyrus won it for having more of a safe style, it seems. So, like, what are his actual strengths and what's it like when you match him specifically? I think... Whoever plays the same style as I do, he plays some different champs, but it's pretty much the same style, just being aggressive at any point you can. But he tends to get very over aggressive at points, and he's very easy to kill. In team fights, for example, where he just goes way too far, and then he just dies. Because there's a, a famous quote of yours that's actually on your Leapedia page, where you say something, this is from a while ago, where you say essentially that to play the 1v1 lane, you have to act as though the jungler isn't there. I mean, I think this is from quite a while ago. Like, does that still apply at all now? Um, yes and no. If you want to win the 1v1, yes, you need to play like it's not there because else you're going to be at a disadvantage. Because if the enemy top laners can play like the jungler isn't there and the jungler doesn't come, then you already lost the lane because you're going to be behind. And if, even if he comes and you die, that means you took um, 
Pressure off the map because the jungler came top, he wasted time top, so the other leagues have a big advantage now. Um, one of the people who's gotten a lot more fame over the last, like, sort of, well, since season two championship, obviously, is Stanley from Taipei Assassins. I know you guys, I think you guys, like, practiced them before that or something. And so, do you have any insight as to what his speciality is at top? Like, what does he do anything different from all the Europeans and the Koreans, etc.? So, I think Stanley is a top laner, like, so was. He's not the best mechanical skill top laner, but he plays all the um, non bruiser champs that doesn't need as much mechanical skill. I mean, like, then you're finding bruiser, you have to trade, but he doesn't get a trade off. Like, you hit him once, you back before he can hit you. He's more like a skill chip type, like Frogniers, for example. They play champions like Elise, Rumble, and all those AP champions. When you think of the Asians in general, because like they're considered overall to be on top because they've got more good teams in those regions. So China, Southeast Asia, Korea. What is it about these teams that allow them all to be so good? Like the one, th one thread that runs through all of the best ones is that their team play is incredible. Like the actual interaction of the players is very, very good. Not just like skill of winning the games. So is there just something about like from having lived in Korea, is there something about the Asian mentality that leads to team play being like easier to come by? What, what's so difficult for Westerners in this sense? Um, I think it's because they try harder as well and they also make more teams. For example, there's a bunch of solo queue players in Europe that could easily make a team be really good. But they're like, now nah, why would we do it? There's only eight person on CS, we, they can't live with it. They don't need to do it either, they're just playing the game for fun. But in Asia it's like, we're gonna try our hardest, we're gonna be the best, and we're just gonna keep becoming the best. That's our goal. One of the strange things about League of Legends is that compared to other games, it seems like it's less important that all the players speak the same language. Like in general, there's even some teams in Europe where they all communicate in English, but none of them are from England or America or anything. So it's all the second language they're communicating in. Like bearing in mind there's a, lot, there's a big emphasis in the game on team play and communication. Like how, when people say you need really good communication, what are they meaning then? Because obviously a lot of these players don't have good English. So what what are you really meaning by communication? Like is it like not saying too much, not saying too little? Like what, what's the balance like? Do you think? So I always thought that it's mainly individual play and team play is very little because it's very easy to do and any solo queue player could easily do it. Like all you have to do is like I have ultimate, I can gank now. It's information that you could write in the chat, but it's quicker by wires. So it's not that essential. It's more like. Do you have ultimates up? Do we not have ultimates? Can we fight? Things like that. But if you're really good individual and if you knew that, oh, he doesn't have ultimate, we could fight now. If you could look at the, um, the screen bars on the top corner, you could see, oh, you have ultimate, all this. If you knew all that information, you didn't need it. So individual skills is way more important in my opinion. Because on this topic of how a team communicates, I found a quote from you where you said that you actually thought to have one shot caller who called all the shots was actually a bad thing because you said he wouldn't have like all the information and so like he'd fail overall. But if we look at a lot of the Asian teams, a lot of them have that system where one guy tells everyone else what to do. Whereas with your team, when I did an interview with Krepo, he was telling me about a scenario where you would have won a game, but all three of you were three of you were trying to do something totally different at the same time, and so it sort of fell apart in that sense. Like, so what are the pros and cons you were thinking of when you said that statement? So there's pros and cons because you need to trust each other and you need to do the same thing. That's obvious. The thing is. If you have one shot caller, there's a less chance of you being right. If you have five shot callers, there's a high chance that you're right. And if I'm 100% sure that I'm right, I'm just gonna speak louder and louder and louder than everyone else until everyone listens to my call. And I think that's a better way to do it because Snoopy might be right, but I'm wrong. And I say something completely stupid and he corrects me and he saves my life and possibly the teams. I mean, it's funny you would say that that's like the system because that sort of is what people would suggest about CLGNA. They used to say like whoever shouted the loudest was the one who made the shot call or whatever. Like, is there, is there downsides to this that you see? Well, I think there's downsides if no one shouts louder and if no one is confident in their call because then you're just going to have a clusterfuck. Um, I think the problem with CLGNA was, yeah, it's good to shout louder, but they start screaming and that doesn't make any sense at that point because they're just screaming, all of them. And once everyone starts screaming and no one even knows if they're right, then it doesn't matter anymore. One of the teams that you played throughout your career was World Elite. So you played them in Korea, you beat them, you played them at World Finals, you beat them, but then they beat you in this epic run they had at IPL. Uh, do you, from the three times you played them, do you see anything big having changed from, from when they, were, they beat you in the last time? I think they've been practicing a lot more because we were also in um, Shanghai to play an All-Star match, or not All-Star, but to play um, Show match against, yeah, for Tencent. And they weren't that good in that time. We didn't really think that much of them, and they have improved a lot. Every single team can improve if they just try harder than everyone else.
Well, what do you make then of uh, Xiaomei on their team? Because on the one thing he has going against him is that because his mid player and his AD are so famous, people aren't going to pay that much attention. But is he like an elite tier top player? I'm not sure because we haven't played against him for a long time. It's a long time since IPL was going and everything can change in one month. And we haven't played him for like three or four months. Oh, okay. well, what was your sense of him when you played him? Like, How good did you think he was and in what areas? Then I played against him, I didn't really think that much special, like I don't think about the names, I'm just playing the champion and it's like, oh he's doing that, okay, and I'm just reacting to the things, I don't think too much about the player. Because I think if you start thinking up to a player and you start being like, he's so good at that and things like that, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to think that he's better than you at that, so you're never going to try and outplay him in that area. One of the things that a lot of people have discussed in season three, I've noticed, especially because of the problems that the NAC LG teams had, is the concept that you have to have lots of threats. You can't just have one area that can be shut down. Like, how, how good does your team do in terms of having multiple threats in every game? I definitely think that you need at least two threats no matter what, and then you need some other heroes that can be semi threats. Like, you need people that are threats because else everyone is just going to flash in and go for one guy, and they're never going to lose a team fight if he's on one of the damage. When, when you say, okay, so you, you've said that the, the reason why the team wasn't doing so good from your perspective was like lack of practice time, just not playing enough, you know. And so you've explained that like that sometimes means like having to cook food or do these things that you didn't have to do at home. Is there a degree to which uh, it's like the, the kind of practice you're getting? Like are you not scrimming the same way? Do you not play solo queue the same way? Like what, what is it you need to improve that we're not seeing here? Um, another thing we also do right now is I've on, that we used to do a little while ago was we start play, picking up new champions all the time. If you get beat by champions, you're like, oh, we need to play as well. We need to play all the champions. And I think that's bad because you can't become the best at 10 champions or 20 champions. If another guy is trying to become the best at three or four champions, he's going to have a better shot than you if you're trying to get best at all the champions. If you think of uh, like the best teams now, is it, are you someone who actually watches like OGN and stuff? Do you, do you scout teams in that sense? Um, I do watch a bit of OGN, I do watch a bit of other tournament, but what I mainly try to focus on is my skills. So if I watch OGN, for example, I'm focusing what is the top laner doing, what is he doing, why is he doing that, and I'm trying to analyze it, because else, for me it's a total waste of time to watch it if I don't understand why he's doing things and I can improve on things. What's, what is your take on how top lane is used in Korea in the current meta? Like, Do they do anything differently to the other regions or differently from before? I don't think they do anything different. It's just. Once in a while, one region is going to find something new and they're going to exploit it and be like, this is the new thing. For example, Shai used Red Elixir in Korea and I saw it and I was like, oh, this could actually be good. So I tried it out and it was really, really good. So I just started using it every game. If, if you look at um, a, a very famous Korean top laner, obviously, is uh, Shai. And the thing is, you guys, didn't you did you play against Blaze when they had him as a stand-in at that MLG? Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is why I want to ask, okay. So everyone like lords him as like, oh, he's an incredible top lane player. But the interesting thing is you're one of the few players who got to play him not only in Frost, which is his main team, but when he was just a sub standing in for this, the, the Blaze team. And so you kind of got to see him within his team and then just as like just another player. Like, it, it, does he live up to the hype of people saying like, he's the best top lane, he's the best in the world? I don't think he's the best in the world. Like, so then he played at Hanover, I actually thought he was playing really bad. But then he was playing at MLG and he was playing in place. I was like, he's carrying the team alone. So it depends, like sometimes you have a bad game, sometimes you have a good game. And he's really, really good at carrying if he gets his good game off. But sometimes he also plays fairly all right only. One of the things aside from being very good that made him so famous is that it seemed like when he got to the top really quickly, it was with quite a small champion pool. And part of, the, part of the thing that a lot of players who are good players pride themselves on is, oh, I can play all these champions. Some, sometimes like average players who are pros will say, oh, I can play 10 champions as though they could play them all amazingly, which seems unlikely. Like how did, what, what is the balance in your mind between having to play a couple really, really well and having like a wide right so you can still pick against people? So I used to only play like three or four champions as well. I used to play really range on Chen and then Malphite or something like that, Rumble. And I think it went well, better for me at that time, but my team, everyone was always giving me flag for, oh, you should play more champions, we need more champions, but I don't think that's true at all. And I think that's one thing that people are realizing now. Because if you look at the America LCS, they're starting to play less champions. The European LCS is starting to play less champions as well, in my opinion. So I think it's really good to train a few champions because you're going to become better with them. And that's also what Charles is doing. 
one of the things of season three that people generally say is like, oh, like the, the jungle position is like stronger than it was in season two. And so now people like Diamond Prox and Insect look like even better than they did before because they can like almost carry from their position. Obviously, one of the people in our teams who's gotten the most flack from the community is Snoopy and people wanting him to be caught or saying he's going to leave or whatever, or maybe he should become a manager. Like, do you already have in mind as a team what Snoopy has to do within this current meta to like make the team successful? Is he still looking for his role? What do you think? So what we want everyone to do in our team is be able to carry, except Kreva because he's the support, he can't carry. And if Snoopy's having a good game, he needs to be able to carry that to help us out so we can win the game. I think that's the main thing that Snoopy has to do, and the only thing that he actually needs to change is to be more aggressive, which he's working on right now. Because he used to play support, his jungles, he used to be fairly defensive, and just depend on other people. For my last question, I always like to do a hypothetical question, okay? And so it's sort of a way of getting people to say their favorite players, but in a different way each time. And so for you, I was thinking of how I'm going to do it. And so aliens come to Earth, like they always do in my scenario, okay? So they kill all of your team. So you can't pick any of your players for your team. They're all dead, unfortunately. So they're going to make you the captain of this all-star team to represent Earth, to like win the battle that will stop the aliens taking over Earth, okay? So if you lose the game, obviously we're all fucked, so it's important you pick the right players here. But what I want you to do is, on, instead of just picking an all-star team that I just play the game, basically Wicked is going to be like Reaper in SK Telecom 1. He's like the star player. He, he tells everyone in the team what to do. He tells them how to play. Everyone, everyone's playing around Wicked in this All-Star team. So which four players at the other positions would fit into the team where you could lead them and you could tell them what to do and they would su support your position and, and you'd win this match? Who would you want? So I'd probably want Alexic because he plays a role where he ganks a lot. He moves around a lot from mid lane or Pekka. One of those two because both of them as mid lane, they're roaming all the time. Then as a jungle, I'd probably take Svenskan. I think Svenskan, he's ganking top a lot. His mechanics are amazing for jungler. Like junglers normally don't have as good mechanics. And of all, his decisioning is amazing as well. As AD carry, I'd probably take Nono, just because of the fact that everyone thinks that he gets caught a lot. He's really aggressive, so it seems that way. And he's easier to cast because he's so aggressive. But it's also good in a way because he takes off pressure from me and people are not going to focus on me as much, so I'll have an easier time to carry. And then Edward has support because he's the most aggressive supporter, obviously. You see him making plays, walking in, doing things, so yeah. So in general you want aggressive players in this team? That would be your style? I want incredibly aggressive players so they can look scary and I can just come from behind and be like, yeah, I'm here as well, I kill people. Oh, okay. Okay, do you have a final message, some words you want to say to someone or thank, etc.? I just want to say thanks for all who supported me, thanks for everyone who worked for me in the All-Star. It's really awesome and I love you guys. Manga Talk. Do welcome.